Hi, thanks for joining me. We're on Mark chapter 13 as we're working our way through the gospel. This is session number 21. So Mark 13 is sometimes called the little apocalypse. And it's been the focus of a lot of preaching by and writing about folks who are very interested in the last days by um, scholarly attention. And for, I, I think, just kind of ordinary folks, uh, frankly, it's led to a lot of head scratching, trying to figure out what's going on here. So in the short time that we have for this session, I'm going to try to do three things. I'm going to try to give a little overview of the chapter. I'm going to talk about how it connects with the history of that time and particularly around the writing of the Gospel of Mark. And then third, I'm going to try to unfold what I think is our best response to what this chapter has to say. So let's kind of start with a look at the structure of the chapter. And uh, so here's kind of a basic outline, and I'll, I'll have a little bit of some really high quality visual aids for us right here. So uh, at the very beginning, there's a little introductory story. Let's look at that. It's just the first two verses. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings? Replied Jesus, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. So this is the last scene in the temple itself that we have in the Gospel of Mark. After this, everything is going to move on outside. We don't know which disciple it was that made this statement of amazement over the temple, but Jesus responds with this shocking answer. I mean, the idea that the temple was going to be destroyed, that would have been breathtaking to them and sobering. So this would have been the exact opposite of what everyone was expecting. They're expecting a Messiah to come that's going to usher in this kingdom, restore Israel to incredible political and military status, and they were not looking for the destruction of that location that was at the very heart of their society. And really, in a sense, by this declaration, Jesus is making a final statement on the disqualification of the temple as the focus of the kingdom of God. That's not where the kingdom of God is located. All right, so then verses 3 and 4 <clears throat> shift physical location and lead into more directly what it is that Jesus has to say. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign? that they are all about to be fulfilled. So they have moved out of the city, across the valley. Now they're sitting across the valley, looking over at Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. And these four original disciples, the first four disciples, Peter and Andrew, James and John, come and ask Jesus privately about when and how are we going to know that this is just about to happen. So now we get to Jesus's major discourse, and uh, it has two big sections, and each of these sections then have three parts to it. And so one of the things that you'll want to know is that all through this, this discourse, this apocalyptic teaching, it is so heavenly influenced by the language and the images of the Old Testament. Jesus often quotes from it um, extensively from uh, particularly Daniel, but he also quotes from Deuteronomy, from Joel, from Isaiah, from Zechariah. And if you have a good study Bible, as you kind of read along through this, then it ought to guide you in the direction of all of those different quotations. So what we have here in this chapter is a representative of a kind of literature called apocalyptic literature. 
or apocalypsis. And the word apocalypse itself is just almost a direct translation from the Greek, apocalypsis, and that means, at the core of it in the Greek, it means uncovering. But by the time of Jesus, it had come to mean the revealing of secrets or divine revelation. And so it was very, very popular, this type of literature at the time of Jesus. There were other Jewish kind of subgroups that were caught up in apocalyptic expectation and were producing apocalyptic literature. The, uh, in our scriptures, the second half of Daniel and the book of Revelation would both be good examples of this type of literature and this type of thinking. And we see it here in Mark chapter 13 also. So let me talk just for a second about literature and really about genres. Uh, we, we all have them in whatever culture we grow up in, and it helps us understand what we read and what we hear. So nowadays, uh, a very popular uh, type of literature would be science fiction. And so when you're reading science fiction and uh, you hear about somebody being teleported from one place to another or uh, a ship that travels at warp speed that bends time and distance or even if it's robots that are just almost human, you just kind of go with it. You accept it. You understand all of that. Or if you're into romance novels, there's going to be a, a lonely woman who's been slighted by others and then there's going to be some villainous character and then there's likely to be a, a, a slightly clueless but um, kind and good-looking man that's going to weave into this story. And so all of these kinds of features that we know and anticipate help us understand what this piece of literature, what this story is trying to tell us. And so apocalyptic literature had characteristics of its own also. It focused on a cosmic confrontation between good and evil. And the evil side had both human agents like um, a, a government or an evil leader, and it would also have some higher spiritual being that was evil. And on the good side, of course, was God and faithful people. And um, those faithful people were usually some kind of oppressed minority by the evil side. And they were looking for the appearance of God's leader, this messianic figure that was going to come rescue them. And this new era would be ushered into being by a, a great conflict between these two forces of good and evil. But the outcome was never going to be in doubt. God and good would always win. But before that final outcome, there would be a time of suffering for the faithful people. And then eventually there would be judgment and punishment for the wicked and there would be reward for the righteous. And so all the apocalyptic literature of that era and what we see in the Bible and in Revelation all kind of have those characteristics and we see that there in Mark chapter 13 also. That helps the listeners of that time easily understand what's going on. We just kind of have to educate ourselves about that a little bit. So let's take a closer look at what Jesus says. So the very first part of chapter 13, as I said, is broken into sort of three sections. It's got three warnings against deceptive signs of the end times. And the first one is appearance of deceivers and wars, and natural disasters, which is verses 5 through 8. So let me read that for you. Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming, I am he, and will deceive many. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. And so I think even still now, it's very common among people who really do have um, a, a high degree of interest in end time things. They, 
They hear about wars. They hear things like, oh, Russia has moved troops, troops into the Middle East, and, and this is the sign. That, and Jesus said, these things are going to happen. It's just the beginning of the birth pains. All right. The second, and then on my little chart here, the third uh, point in this section is that there's going to be persecution of Jesus' disciples, verses 9 through 13. Verse 9 says, You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. And on account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say what is given to you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. That's a great insight, isn't it? Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. So once again, this is a warning that these are some signs that it's the beginning, but it doesn't mean that Jesus is coming right now. And so we're going to experience difficulties and persecution. The third one then is the appearance of the desecrating sacrilege in the temple and a false Christ. So this is verses 14 to 23. When you see the abomination that causes desolation. So that little phrase is a quote from Daniel. And it referred to an event that happened 200 years earlier when a pagan leader stood in the temple and there at that most sacred place offered sacrifices and stopped the Jewish sacrifices. And so now Jesus is saying, just like that happened back then, it's going to happen again. When you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one go up on the housetop. Excuse me. Let no one on the housetop go down or enter the house to take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not happen in the winter because those will be days of distress unequaled from the beginning when God created in the world until now and never to be equaled again. If the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So be on your guard. I have told you everything in advance. So there's an awful lot of parallels between this and some other passages that we find in the Bible about the last days and that it will be a time of, there will be some period of incredible difficulty and um, God will be merciful and cut the difficulty time period short. All right, now the second part of this passage is about the last days and some, some warnings from Jesus about being watchful for that. So the first part of that is about the coming of the Son, and it's verses 24 to 27. And again, this is quoting from the Old Testament. But in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds and from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. So obviously this then is talking about something that really is going to happen at the very end of time. When Jesus comes back again and all of his elect will be gathered together. 
Then Jesus offers kind of a, a little two-part statement about being watchful. And we'll talk about what being watchful means in just a minute. But the first is he offers uh, some little parables about it and some teachings. And so this is what he says, starting in verse 28. Excuse me, just a second. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is coming. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near, right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that hour and day, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's going to be like a man going away. He leaves his house, he puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and he tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the cock crows or at dawn. And if he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. So beginning with sort of some parables about a fig tree, about people staying at a house when the owner has been gone away, it's full of this talk about we need to be ready, we need to be watchful. And I'll talk about what that means in just a minute. And then the third section is just literally a concluding sentence. And Jesus says this, What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. Watch. All right. Now, part, I think, of understanding what this passage means is to understand what happens just in a very short time right after Jesus' earthly ministry. And so it's known as the first Jewish revolt. There was another one about 60 years later. And it, it was basically between about 66 and 73 A.D., so just some 30, 35 years after the time of Jesus. Now, this was a massive revolt in the Jewish territories against the rule of Rome. You need to understand that it was not unanimous among the people by any stretch. There were sort of three categories of people. There were the zealots. Remember, one of Jesus' disciples was a zealot. And these were people who actively campaigned for military revolt against uh, Rome. There were the Pharisees. And the Pharisees did not initially support a revolution, but once it began to unfold, they got on board with it. And then the third group is the Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees were all along from the, before the time of Jesus, time of Jesus on to now 30 years later, they really are the wealthy, elite, upper crust of the society, and they had no interest in any kind of revolt against Rome. And it may have been that they just realized that a revolt would be futile, or more likely they were interested in protecting their own wealth and their status. And so uh, there was a significant group in the middle, people who just weren't sure what to do and what side to go on. But at various times throughout this half a dozen year period, especially the first several years, these three factions really were at battle with each other. At times, inside the city of Jerusalem, they were fighting and killing each other while the Romans are coming down the road. It was a chaotic and bloody, vicious time. Exactly the kind of thing that you see here. Now, it was, in a real sense, a revolution, not just simply against Rome, but against the elite ruling class, um, the Roman taxes and the temple taxes that the Sadducees primarily would collect were so burdensome on the ordinary people. And the Roman governors were corrupt uh, and brutal. So, for example, during the tenure of Pontius Pilate, Pontius Pilate involved in the uh, trial of Jesus, 
There was concern about the water supply in Jerusalem, so Pontius Pilate decided to build an aqueduct to bring water into Jerusalem. But what he did was go to the temple, and he took temple tax money to pay for this aqueduct. And then when there was a protest about taking the temple tax money, he sent the soldiers out to just brutally suppress this protest, and there were there were there, there was a whole crowd of Jewish leaders that were killed. And the final governor that really led to the turning point of this revolt, he was so corrupt. He routinely took bribes. Everybody knew it. Um, he would just arbitrarily rule against the Jewish people all the time, sometimes even when he took their, their bribes. Finally, he plundered the temple, and that led to a rebellion that overran the military garrison and in about 66 then, they took over Jerusalem. And so, despite, and this is where some of this ties in, despite the massive, obvious military superiority of Rome, there was this widespread belief in a Messiah that was going to come usher in this new kingdom of Israel. And of course, they have all the biblical history, you know, the conquering of the promised land with Joshua, where time after time, God had given them military victory over some overwhelming army. And so there was a lot of popular belief that this kind of thing could happen again. In October of 66, after they've taken over Jerusalem, uh, the Romans send a force of 36,000 Roman legionnaires from Syria in the north down to quell this uprising and secure Jerusalem. About 14,000 Jewish fighters fight against them and give them an unexpected defeat. In fact, that's actually, um, in Roman history, one of the most shameful defeats that they ever had. At a location where there had been a famous Jewish battle victory a hundred years before, and it was just full of religious significance to them that now we've won this battle here again, and it brought even more people over into the revolution. So now Rome really has to act. So Rome sends four Roman legions and the general Vespasian over to the Middle East. And they start up in the far north and they work their way down through Galilee, just taking over the countryside until eventually they start getting closer to Jerusalem. Now at that point, uh, Nero has died. There's a lot of confusion over in Rome about who's going to be emperor and so Vespasian goes back to Rome and he leaves his son Titus there in charge and uh, Titus decides to have a siege over Jerusalem and in the summer uh, late 69 the summer of 70 he has his seventh month siege around Jerusalem uh, it's terrible there is vicious fighting inside Jerusalem about what they should do uh, thousands of people killed each other there's a horrible famine and what the Romans do is they dig a huge trench all the way around the city and then outside that trench they pile up their own earthen wall as tall as the walls of the city of Jerusalem and then when people would try to escape Jerusalem and they would get caught down in this trench the Roman soldiers would go get them apprehend them and take them up on their earthen wall and crucify them there in view of everyone in the city just to invoke terror with the citizens of Jerusalem. There are records that uh, it, it, there were days when they would crucify 500 people a day on these walls displayed in front of the city. Well, finally, the Roman legions broke down the walls uh, they go inside the city, they, they tear down the temple, everything except that one little section of the Wailing Wall that is still standing. Uh, the city is burned, survivors are taken off as slaves. And so it's really easy to see how this event that happens just 30, 35 years after the time of Jesus reflects so many of the kinds of things that Jesus talks about right here including, obviously, the destruction of the temple. So let me talk for a minute about 
when Mark was written, so do remember Mark was not one of the original, uh, original disciples of Jesus. Uh, we have an early church father, Papias, who about 130 AD says that, has a very short little paragraph, but he says that Mark was Peter's interpreter, which that's interesting, and he wrote down what, Mark, what Peter had to say, and out of that, he wrote this gospel. And so most scholars think that Mark was written in about the 60s AD, shortly before the fall of Jerusalem and the tearing down of the temple. There are some scholars, and you need to know this because you may come across this at some point, there are some scholars who believe that this whole passage and its parallels in Matthew and Luke were written after the destruction of the temple, and it's written as prophecy to somehow make it look like Jesus knew this was going to happen. Now, that's the minority of scholars, and that's not what I accept. That's not widely accepted. But it does bring us to this question. And so this is an important kind of uh, Bible understanding question that you, you'll have to wrestle with some too. Was the fall of Jerusalem and the abomination of desolation and all these other things that are described there in Mark chapter 13, was that fulfilled with the destruction of the temple and this whole terrible experience in 70 AD? Was that the fulfillment of what Jesus had to say? At least the first part of that. Obviously not his coming. That's the second part. And when we think about things like verse 30, truly I tell you, this generation will surely not pass away until all these things have happened. Well, that makes that a little bit more understandable, but it doesn't account for all of the things that Jesus says in this passage. So that's kind of option one. Did the tearing down of the temple, the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD fulfill this? Or option B, is all of this chapter 13 about some yet to come future event? And that would be the position of most of the popular end time teachers, whether it's books you read or, or you find them online or TV or somewhere else. And so, for example, they would say that the, um, that the abomination of desolation will refer to some future event that happens in Jerusalem where some future evil person stops the sacrifices from occurring and does something horrific there. And, of course, that means then there's going to have to be a temple rebuilt and Jewish sacrifices restarted. And so I, I'm sure if you've done much reading about end times, you find an awful lot of fascination about we got to get this uh, Muslim dome taken away so the temple can be rebuilt there so that then all these other things can happen. And there's in verse 10, it says, and the gospel must first be preached to all nations. And so some people say that Jesus cannot come back until the gospel is delivered to every language group in the world. And so there's some whole mission organizations that are very diligent about tracking down which language groups around the world have not heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we've got to go take the gospel to them because Jesus can't come back until that happens. So, which of those two is it? Is it that 70 AD fulfilled at least the first part of this? Or is it that all of this is about something yet out there to come? A great tribulation, and a temple rebuilt, and the gospel going to every linguistic group in the world? Well, I may be wrong. And uh, I, I'm sure I, God's going to tell me when I get in heaven I was wrong about a lot of things that I thought about the Bible. But I lean towards that Jesus, when he was talking about the temple being destroyed and the abomination, was talking about what happened in 70 A.D. But, and now, but, this is the most important thing. And actually, this is really the most important thing that Jesus was trying to say. It's the clearest thing that we can get out of this passage. There are a lot of these other things that are, are kind of hazy to us, but this is absolutely clear, and we can't misunderstand these points of the passage. So this is kind of our response. So number one, 
No one knows the timing. No one knows. The end of the world, the second coming of Christ, all that kind of thing. In fact, that's the whole point of Jesus' first warnings. All these kinds of things are going to happen. There are going to be wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and famines. And listen, that's going to happen. It's all just the beginning. And so any attempt to identify the timing of Jesus' return is unbiblical. It's bogus. So I know folks who say, oh, it's going to happen on this Jewish holiday. Oh, it's going to happen five years from now. Oh, Jesus could come back right now. He's not hindered in anything that he wants to do by our creation of a chart or a timetable, and nobody knows. Well, the second thing is, what we can also be certain about is he will return. Uh, this is not just something that's spiritualized or emotional. Jesus will return, and he will quash evil, and he will set things right. And for anyone who is going through a difficult time in life, this is incredibly comforting. Now, the core thing that we ought to take out of this is what Jesus says time and time and time again, which is we ought to be alert we ought to be watchful. We ought to be prepared. That very last verse, verse 37, in the Greek literally says, What I say to you, I say to everyone, and the last word is just simply the command, watch. That's the last word. Don't miss it. Well, that's an interesting word. You could, it's kind of a little bit broad in how you could say that. You could say, uh, be vigilant. Uh, watch zealously over it, guard it, be alert. It's related to be awake, wake up, be attentive, be on guard. And so that's what Jesus is saying to us. Now, certainly I think it means be alert, be attentive, be on, uh, be on guard because Jesus is coming back. All these things are going to happen. But when we look throughout the, old, the rest of the New Testament and the way this is used in some similar passages, it's not just simply be watchful for Jesus' return in the sky. It's be watchful about our life. Be watchful about the state of our soul. Be vigilant about our walk with God. It, it sometimes pairs it up with being pure, being prepared for his return. We want to be ready when Jesus comes back. We want to be as close to him as we can possibly be. So that idea about being watchful is not just simply, well, I'm going to stand around and watch in the skies for Jesus to come, or I'm going to study all these things in the news, and I'm going to figure out some little timetables and charts, and I think this is, no, it's be watchful over our hearts and guard our hearts so that we can be ready and prepared, a bride fit for the bridegroom when he comes back. And then maybe a fourth thing would be this. If we truly believe that all of this is happening, that Jesus is going to come back again, then we should be busy and diligent about sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with others. If we really believe the time is short, who says we have next year, next month, next week, tomorrow to share Christ with our friends? Thank you for your time tonight. Let's stop and pray for a moment. Father, thank you so much for these words. And it's easy sometimes for us to get kind of caught up in sensationalistic kind of stuff. But God, help us to listen to Jesus' words. We don't know. But what we do know is it is going to happen and it is going to come. And it'll be at some, frankly, unexpected time. And so what we want to do is we want to be ready. Help us, God, not only to be ready for when Jesus comes, but to make sure that we've watched over our hearts, our lives, so that when we come, we are prepared to meet Jesus. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being with me this evening.